met her in the fall. He took her to a movie, and when they done it all, he took her. To Hello and welcome to the Fabulous Picture Show. I'm Amanda Palmer. This week we're joined for the Q and A by Joe Munga, whose debut feature Viva Riva. Well, it's a fascinating, gory, brutal look at the Congolese underworld. Arriving in Kinshasa with a cargo of stolen fuel, Reva tries to seduce the local gangster's girl. In the Q&A, the director explains why his gangsters rarely just shoot their enemies. When it comes to Africa, we want people to suffer before they die. Also on the show... My brothers, welcome to Baghdad. The highs... And lows of being Udo Hussein's body double were hard to relive for the real stand-in. I took six tablets of Valium. I was panic attack. But first, a film that truly captures the magic of dance for the cinema screen, all thanks to the latest 3D technology. The latest documentary from German legend Wim Wenders is a tribute to his friend, the innovative choreographer, Pina Bausch. Known for her rich imagination, Bausch blended startling dance movements with theatre and music. Pina's work is so much about what happens between men and women, without words just with gesture, with the force of attraction and reaction and love and hate. That is the most human thing. There have been previous documentaries about Pina. <laughs> and like the 2006 film Pina Bausch, vendors had intended to observe her at work. But she unexpectedly passed away two days before filming. So the film, instead of being a film how Pina looked at the world and at her dances, it became a film about how they remembered her. Pina, j'ai toujours pas rêvé de toi, tu sais. J'attends que tu viennes me faire une petite visite. Moi, j'ai eu tes nouvelles par Daphne, qui lui rêve tout le temps de toi. C'est pas pareil, hein. I use Pina's own method. I would ask them questions and they would answer with their bodies, with gestures, with their dance. Wenders collaboration with Pina dates back to the 1980s. In the beginning, Pina smiled a little bit, didn't say anything. Never said much anyway, but a few years later it was her who kept asking about that film. Aren't you, couldn't, should we be serious about it? We should do it. It took over 20 years to find the right format. I realized between the experience of Pina's Tanztheater, the experience of her art, the physicality and the immediacy and the urgency of it and how much it concerned every spectator in his body and his soul and how much it got to the core of you. I did not know how cameras could get there. I did not know. It felt always, I came to every performance and felt there was a wall for my cameras. Until that wall had a crack one day. I stared at this film, U2 in 3D, and realized that was the answer. That medium would allow me to have access to the magic of Pina's work and to the realm of her dances. I only had a desire what 3D could do. There was no proof that it could actually do it. In order to make it, we had really had to push the technology. To stop the crane holding two huge 3D cameras from smashing into the dancers, the entire crew had to learn the choreography by heart. If you want to make somebody's art shine, you cannot impose yourself. You have to make the language, your technology, become 
invisible. And that is a huge task for a filmmaker, to withdraw so that the other thing is as beautiful as possible. children of power man dictators know that the body double is an essential accessory but for the rest of us the story of Uday Hussein's double is a bit of an eye-opener. Uday Hussein was the notoriously sadistic son of Saddam Hussein known for raping schoolgirls, killing courtiers and partying while Baghdad burned. Do you know who this is? Of course. No, no, no. It is not who you think it is. His name is Faust Alamari, not Saddam. The Devil's Double is inspired by the true story of Latif Yahya. It is not so unusual, Latif. Stalin had a double. He had dozens, so did the Shah. A former classmate of Uday's. Look at me! Who was forced to become his body double. I want you to be my fide. I want you to be my brother. Don't say anything, hmm? Take 10 minutes. Think it over. What happens if I say no? Director Lee Tamahori's thriller is set in the years around Iraq's 1990 Q8 invasion, when oil flowed like water. It's your turn, brother. F them. F Q80s. Both dastardly Uday and stoic Latif are played by British actor Dominic Cooper. My brothers, welcome to Baghdad. I was continually astounded by the full horror of what he did to people with no reasoning, no justification. It was, it was, and that was very a, a big challenge, not having any sympathy towards the person who you were inhabiting. And his seamless duality certainly sucked in French actor Ludovine Sanier, who plays concubine Sarab. Today he's infatuated with you. He's quite dazzled. He thinks he made you up just like that, out of the dust. Tomorrow, he snaps his fingers and you vanish. When he was dressed up as Latif, I remember we were very um, playful and aggressive and you know how actors are on set, like, you know, like little cats and dogs. And when, when uh, Dominique was dressed up as a day, suddenly I was much more uh, respectful and serious. The real Latif suffered torture and violence from a day before fleeing to Austria in 1992. Discipline. Hmm? We must have discipline. If we have chaos, we have disorder. He weathered several assassination attempts <laughs> and is one of the few surviving members of the regime's inner circle. I saw a lot of torture. A lot of people was just to please Saddam. There was the one those. And Saddam, he don't know. Believe me, a lot of things happen. Saddam, he don't know. I'm not defending Saddam. He's gone. The country is ruled and finished. Just not everything was going to him. Few mourned when Uday and his brother Kusay were killed by US forces in 2003. Latif's first viewing of the film was understandably traumatic. My first reaction, I smashed a bottle. I took four, five, six tablets of Valium. I was panic attack, I was heavy breathing. But despite the somber backdrop, the cast had no illusions about what sort of film they were making. This was not an, an accurate historical biopic, but ultimately it's a big, lavish gangster film about some really repulsive gangsters who ran a country and had no limitations put upon them. Everybody, welcome to the Fabulous Picture Show and this special screening of Viva Riva. Please welcome the filmmaker here, Joe Munga. <laughs> Tell us what this film means for you. I mean, 
the film means a lot, of course, as a first feature film. But also for like uh, coming from Congo, we haven't done like a feature film for 25 years. Uh, it's also produced from Congo with the Congolese director, it's me. And and it's like all there was all this energy and also like it's like the twenty first century. So we want to be modern, we want to be contemporary. So it is like it's all that. Kinshasa is running on empty. But for amiable hustler Riva, the fuel shortage offers a whiff of opportunity. Hello. Gio? Riva. He steals a truckload of gas from Angolan gangsters. And they're not amused. Riva then sets his sights on glamorous Nora, concubine of yet another gangster. Viva Riva takes us on a unique and hair raising journey through Kinshasa's criminal underworld. Congolese filmmaker Joe Munger, who attended film school in Belgium, didn't want a squeaky clean hero, but someone true to Kinshasa's people, the keen one. Riva is someone who's living the high life, but at the same time doesn't look at the burden that he has. That's where I, I see his real like quinoa, is that people who have a lot of energy and focusing on a day-to-day -day life and not really caring about what's happening behind yeah. Joe's documentary training is obvious in Viva Riva's frank exposure of the ills of the Democratic Republic of Congo, from a culture of greed and endemic corruption. Et comme ça, to the racism that exists amongst African nations. In this story, there is the Angolans who are looking down at the Congolese, but in many other countries, like East Africa, they're looking down at other Africans, you know? It would be us, Congolese from Kinshasa, looking down at people of Congo Brazzaville and, and the other way around. As well as causing a stir at worldwide film festivals, Viva Riva recently picked up six trophies at Africa's biggest film awards. You wrote this film, you directed this film, you produced as well. I mean, you are a master of many here. What was important about this story in particular? When I, I came back to Kinshasa after my, my studies, like 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I wanted to, to make a film which could be a portrait of my city, my hometown, Kinshasa. I came with that story of that guy coming back from Angola. <laughs> and then I could bring the audience to different places that normally they wouldn't go. And then to talk about all these like topics, dancing, music, a nightlife, but also corruption, a police administration, you know, all about this like uh, the city which is really complex, but at the same time beautiful. How much is that film based in reality? Well, I think everything that you see in, in the film is like fact. Okay, I come from documentary background, and I've been mainly working on on like uh, this doc documentary perspective. But I'm talking about like the last twenty years. Okay, that you we had in, in Congo. Give us a quick history lesson. You had a dictatorship for 30 years. Yeah, we had the coup from Mobutu, which opened the door for 32 years of dictatorship. Terrible, terrible times. And after that, we had five years of war with the five million people who died. Now we, are, we could say we are Democrats, I would say, and we try to, to move on. So you feel that this is very much part of that? I think so. I mean, to have like a Congolese movie coming out now and also to have these awards also means that our society is trying to, to, to regenerate itself, try to rebuild something. In a country like yours, where obviously it's been ravaged by starvation, poverty, crime, all these things, as you say, culture and film is not usually on the high list of priorities for government policy. Tell us about how you managed to garner the support here, and, and you pretty much had to train your own filmmakers and your own team, didn't you? The production is like an army. You need to have a strong organization. You need to have like, uh, intelligent people, really organized and really disciplined. And so I started a like, training program you know, to build stuff and to build young uh, filmmakers. And this core group of 15, 20 
young Congolese which were ran around me worked with the head of departments who came from Europe. So it's this like combination which really made like the success of the production. I read you auditioned 200 actors. A bit more, maybe 300, 350. Then we open into the street and we extract 20 people. And we organize a training program where they were like watching films, learning about the history of cinema, but also playing in front of the camera. <laughs> Right now, the African film industry is dominated by Nigerian films, and what we call Nollywood, which makes an enormous amount of films, and they tend to be made very fast. What are you guys waiting for? Jesus. Action. You meet directors who are making feature films in 10 days. <laughs> I mean, it's a business. But this looks nothing like a Nollywood film. Why didn't you let my friend in? Okay, Oga. You are very, very stupid. In Nollywood, I think, basically, what they do is, like, they, they make stories to make money, which is different from what I've, I've tried to do uh, with this film, is that even if it's a gangster movie, even set in Kinshasa with Congolese characters, the, all the idea is to have first a proper story, to have first proper uh, characters, and to try to bring some artistic element inside. And that takes time. On another level, I respect Nollywood for what they do, because you also heard about like the, the West African uh, cinema and some other films which were sponsored by... French ministry, etc., etc. But you had these great directors who made these films, which are known worldwide, but Africans don't, don't watch these films. <laughs> these films do not answer to the demand of the population in terms of like our societies, people need to have uh, in film have a reflection of their life, like a mirror. And in that vacuum, Nollywood had films and story where people could at least connect. Ce n'est pas un hôtel ici. On ne débarque pas à n'importe quelle heure. Excusez-nous, Père Gaston. Vous payez par tête 500 dollars d'avance. La maison de Dieu? C'est le tarif de hors la loi. You said that you wanted to show all the different aspects of DRC. You know, it's, it mostly focuses on crime and corruption and death. Was it intentional that you showed more of the dark side of Kinshasa? I mean, Kinshasa is a really joyful city, but still this is a thriller, okay? So there is still, even if in the joyful society, there is always a dark side. There are many things that we don't see behind the image, behind the dancing, behind the music. And I wanted to get into this line because I think also it's my work as a filmmaker is that uh, I'm not making tourism. The idea is to talk about what people don't talk about, basically. But I, I hope that's why I hope that there will be many more filmmakers, that some others will do it differently. <laughs> Last week I was in Hong Kong. I was uh, surprised how they were shocked by the violence mm. of the Ooh. film. <laughs> was that a mm? you yeah <laughs> but we say well, there are all these action movies in uh, in Hong Kong but it's different it works at a different level did you think it was violent yes. 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 what was violent inside what was there that you haven't you haven't seen oh, on some the charcoal on the head so that scene works <laughs> actually <laughs> You know, when you see the mafia, Sicilian, they come, they shoot someone in the head. They just want to kill him. Yep. So he's gone. That's for business. Okay. But when it comes to Africa, <laughs> in the violence, <laughs> there is something else about like we want people to suffer before they die. Why? I suspect that maybe like we are traumatized people and we are not aware of that because we have like 100 years mm. of, of trauma. You want the person to suffer the way you suffer inside, you know. So with the, the charcoal scene that you're talking about, of course I wouldn't show what is happening there, but at least the things that you get that sense of like violence that, that people are just like transferring to the others, which is also in reality. I actually screamed when they <laughs> threw coal on him <laughs> and closed my eyes. <laughs> I usually never go to see violent movies. <laughs> My girls warned me before, and mum, this is not for you. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> but some of us enjoy a bit of, it's quite titillating to scream sometimes, don't you think? Didn't you enjoy that little scream? No, I would <laughs> like the Italian <laughs> mafias shoot them and they die. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. not painful. See, at least we know that he didn't pander to the Western audience then, no. don't we?
C'est toi qui vas les tuer. Ça sert à ta punition. Of making a sequel because you left certain things hanging. It's funny that people talk about this sequel. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about it, not at all. You know, it's only when you're in festivals and especially American producers, are you going to make a sequel? Are we going to do this? <laughs> so, no, no, I don't think so. I think it's also good to leave some question open, actually. That's what it's all about, I think. Thank you so much for joining us on The Fabulous Picture Show. Everybody, I think we've had a great honour and a filmmaker to come all this way and to tell us about a film that is really making history in your country. Thank you, Joe. Joe Munga. Thank you very much. In the big bad city of Kolkata, Rajesh and his crew are closing in on another target of Operation Tiger. A suspected fake shampoo vendor. British director Philip Cox's documentary, The Bengali Detective, spotlights a new industry born from India's high urban crime and patchy policing. Our starting point for this film was uh, why are people turning to private detectives? It's a phenomenon happening in India. And that does raise the question about when people don't trust the authorities, where do they turn? Rajesh's casebook reflects some of the region's biggest criminal headaches. <laughs> like counterfeiting, which costs legitimate businesses billions. <laughs> And the 70% of Indian murders that go unsolved. <laughs> Cox scoured the country for over a year to find the perfect protagonist. It's very important for me in the film to have, first of all, a positive lead character. Uh, this new Indian emerging middle class, a self made man. Oh, two. We found many detectives and they were all ex-military, very square, and we wanted to find an everyman, some guy uh, who we could all relate to. And in Rajesh, he found not just a crime fighter, but a passionate amateur dancer, who even manages to rope in his colleagues. Cox gained access to some delicate and deeply personal cases. I've been married for 24 years. 24 years, okay. And uh, I would like to know the whereabouts, of where, what my husband is up to. And Rajesh endures more than his own fair share of heartache. But his cheerfulness and determination cannot be dampened. <laughs> That's it for this fabulous picture show. And what I love about these Q&As is you learned something new. You didn't even know that that charcoal scene really worked. Yeah, exactly, because you never know, actually. And that's the first time, like, discussing with an audience, saying, I was afraid. Well, you just come back to the Fabulous Pitch Show and your next film will sort you out. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Rimba! Rimba! On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate this film? I would give it 9. Um, I'd say 7. None of it was Hollywood and none of it felt like it was exaggerated. It's the location that made it, really. It doesn't hold anything back in terms of graphic detail. Really interesting. First Congolese film I've ever seen. So I'm very happy to see that an achievement in itself. I was actually amazed how realistic it was. It was so truthful to what actually happens in Congo. Mm -hmm.